Hello, I'm William Calvin, a medical school professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And here I'm going to talk about climate denial. Psychological factors are now playing a key role in our failure to address the looming climate crisis. While analyzing what's going on with psychology, I'll summarize the climate science that's being denied, including the knock-on consequences of global overheating that we're already suffering from. Uh, denial is sometimes willful ignorance. So There's a fine example uh, back in Galileo's time when he invited other astronomers to look through the telescope and they refused to do so. Uh, he was describing imperfections of the heavenly bodies and they said everyone knew they were perfect spheres so there was no need to look. So again, we have an example here of uh, saying what you're expected to say rather than what you might actually think. The modern parallel, of course, is all the people who don't believe the IPCC 2007 climate assessment, despite never having read it. <laughs> well, practice is one. Uh, Alice in Wonderland says at one point, there's no use trying, she said, one can't believe in possible things. Said the queen, I dare say you haven't had much practice. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. First, I'm going to give you about a three-slide orientation to global warming and the proposed treatments. Climate is just the long-term view of weather. It's the annual averages of temperature, precip, winds, as well as their annual highs and lows. When temperature sets a new high, that's just weather the first time it happens, but when such new high type events repeat, only a few years later, you start suspecting climate change. The 2003 European heat wave could have been mere weather, a once in 500 years event, but then it repeated in 2010. By now, most of us know that we're overheating, but it's, that's been clear only since 1976. There's a lack of trend from 1950 to 1976 that certainly confused things. Uh, but since 76, it's been going up uh, exactly the way that uh, you might expect from the, the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is mostly from burning coal and oil and natural gas uh, to put CO2 in the air. Uh, most people know that it promises to get much worse, sort of, someday. Uh, unless, of course, we reduce emissions, clean cars, clean energy, more efficient this and that. This is basically the 1970s uh, greenhouse gas agenda, largely unchanged. Uh, we're trying to get this across for 40 years now uh, without much success. But things have changed in that 40 years since then. Uh, it's not only slowly overheating, but we now have to take into account that it's the extreme events that do the damage, not just the uh, air conditioning bills during the summertime, it promises to get much worse, but it, because of the suddenness of the extreme events, uh, it could be later this year as well as the end of the century. Unless we reduce the emissions, this list really is totally inadequate now. It was, but it, it would have worked perhaps back in the 1970s. But now, unless you do a real fix that removes the CO2, all these things will be t too little as well as too late. Now, a view of climate denial and its paid promotion. Uh, first of all, we have to sort of separate skepticism from denial. Uh, even climate scientists may be skeptical about a given line of data or argument, but there's certainly no blanket skepticism amongst the scientists like there is amongst the so-called climate skeptics. Uh, we've, been, we've heard climate uh, science called a hoax by uh, several presidential candidates. 
It's very reminiscent of what was heard back in the Weimar Germany era, just before Hitler. Uh, the political right called Einstein's theory of relativity a hoax and said he was in it for the money, much as climate deniers argue today. Uh, Rick Perry, the Texas governor, uh, said climate change is unproven theory created by a substantial number of scientists who have manipulated data so that they will have dollars rolling into their projects. These sort of ad hominem attacks on scientists and other things designed to get them to keep their heads down politically uh, has become. But there are also economic aspects of denial. And let me go through the history of more efficient use of electricity. Uh, this is the electricity consumption per person uh, since 1960. And what you see here is the U.S. consumption went up from about 4 to about 12. So uh, we've tripled our per person use of electricity over that period. But you notice here there's this one state, California, and uh, all of Western Europe is similar to this, which after 1973 oil crisis times uh, decreased their dependence and managed to hold electricity consumption flat. Now, you might ask what that funny red line is up there. Well, let's see another line first. These are the so-called blue states uh, that, that voted for uh, uh, the Democratic presidential candidate in 2004. And, well, those are the red states. Indeed, in addition to climate denial, they'd probably like to engage in electricity consumption denial because this shows them as the most profligate wasters of electricity in the country. Next, I want to suggest that denial is not so much about doubting the science as it is about <clears throat> avoiding ostracism. Uh, a couple of public opinion polls here. Um, a uh, question that's been asked every year in the last 10 is, have the effects of global warming already begun? And they also ask the people to describe themselves if, as either liberal, moderate, or conservative. And you see here that uh, while the people describing themselves as liberals thought global warming had begun by about 70%, moderates by about 60%, that the conservatives, while they were up at 50%, uh, then dipped and then went back up to 50%, and that had this precipitous decline after Tea Party politics came in, down to 30%. So you can see that at least two out of five of the uh, conservatives, that would be four out of ten conservatives, rather, uh, have changed their mind about the facts. Now, this isn't due to, I think, a, a, an ignorance of science or a lack of interest in science. If you take and ask what percent of Americans surveyed describe themselves as being interested in science, uh, it's pretty high. It's up around 90%. Uh, medical discoveries a bit more so, space exploration a bit less so, but it's pretty high. And you got to try to square that. So it's not a matter that people aren't interested in science, it's that they make exceptions for certain subjects. And evolution, denying evolution is uh, the classic. If you just ask evolution true or false, uh, some countries will get 85-90% people saying it's true. And in the U.S., if you ask that, you'll get an answer down about 40%. Um, U.S. is down with the Islamic countries in this regard. And it really has to be seen as a cultural phenomenon. Uh, one of the best analyses for climate denial is the following. We have a strong interest in mirroring the views of our own cultural group. On issues like climate change, for most people, these cultural calculations trump any attempt to make an objective assessment of the evidence. This is Dodd Kahan from Yale speaking. 
The climate denial, it seems to me, is trying to make climate a taboo subject with ostracism as the threat. Now let's discuss denial and belief. Um, scientists don't believe in global warming. That's not a fair thing to say. It's not a matter of belief anymore. Uh, it's no longer a hunch or a hypothesis because we can give you a dozen lines of evidence for overeating. And even if one of them had problems serious enough to make us distrust it, this wouldn't make the other 11 go away. So let's go through some of nature's thermometers. Uh, here's the instrumental record that I showed you before, except I've overlaid another four data sets uh, that show you basically the same thing. Uh, and they're snipped from this uh, illustration of the so-called hockey stick going back to 1800, the estimates of temperature. Well, suppose for some reason this were all wrong. Improbable that that seems. But suppose it was. Well, it wouldn't change anything uh, about the climate prognosis. Uh, here's pictures of a glacier in Austria in 1985, and again 15 years later, uh, vastly reduced in size. This has been happening worldwide. Here's South America, one of the big ice sheets in the Andes, swelling over into a valley, and 20 years afterwards, it was reduced to very little. Uh, most of you, in fact, know the story of the Arctic uh, sea ice. Uh, if we um, take a look at Greenland there, that is ice that is about two miles thick. And over the Arctic Ocean, that's just floating ice. Same as on a pond, except it might be one or two meters thick. But the amount of it at the end of summer has diminished quite a lot. And some of the models are now suggesting that another 30 years or so, nothing might be left in summer. Uh, then there are indicators such as diseases that get out of control if the winter isn't cold enough because too many beetle larvae survive the winter. And when they start eating everything in sight in the springtime, uh, they damage the bark of the trees so badly that the trees die. This is up in British Columbia, and it's showing you the extent of the uh, damage from the pine beetle infestation. This is producing an amount of CO2 from the trees rotting, and sometimes burning, uh, about CO2 that is even greater than that produced by all the cars and trucks on Canada's highways. Then you have wildfires, and they stay down at about a half million acres each year in the western U.S. up until about 1976 when the temperature started going up, and then you see that the wildfires have increased tenfold uh, in just a 30-year period. And America's really only catching up to the rest of the world's fire problem. You see that from these bar graphs of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, that uh, the rest of the world started having a lot more fire uh, long before we did. Another of the indirect effects of overheating is to have more heavy rain events and also heavier snow events as well. Uh, it's, it's really nonsense saying that if you have a lot of snow in the winter that it's be a disproof of global warming. In fact, it is one of the proofs because what was predicted long ago just from the thermodynamics was that there was going to be a, a lot of uh, additional evaporation from the tropics being hotter and that this would fall, some of it on land, uh, creating floods. Uh, there are consequences of that, we've seen locally. Uh, so let's discuss floods now. Floods also have been going up, and this is just the, the bar chart for the Americas. Uh, these are the number of floods in the 1950s, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And what you say is that in the 60s, the number of floods doubled. 
In the 70s, they doubled the 60s. And in the 80s, they doubled the 70s, and so on. Uh, so the Americans have had the severe problem, and again, it's a worldwide issue. This has been happening all over the place. In particular, let's look, going back to very heavy precipitation. Uh, this is just the U.S., and what you notice here is New England up there has a 67% increase over a few decades ago in the number of days with very heavy precipitation. Uh, the country is up in general. Uh, it's not down anywhere. Uh, but New England and even down into West Virginia uh, has really been getting. This is the scientist's editorial comment in a, in a news article. The intellectual rot runs runs wide, 96 of 100 newly elected Republican members of Congress either deny climate change is real or have signed pledges vowing not to spend a nickel on it. So how can people deny all of this very different kind of data on uh, climate change getting us into more and more trouble? Well, there's a bumper sticker that, that does summarize it. I've already made up my mind. Don't confuse me with the facts. But the question is still why. So where are these people really coming from? Uh, are they stupid? I think that sort of name calling is just to underestimate things. I think opportunists might be a bit closer, at least for the leadership. Uh, there's the sole principle of follow the money. <clears throat> sort of a legal principle uh, that somebody who would gain something from an action or an event is probably responsible for it. And follow the money in this case shows that just in an 18th month period, the energy industry spent half a billion dollars fighting climate change legislation. And according to new scientists, much of the effort was to cast doubt on the findings of climate science or to impugn scientists' reputations and motives. You have to imagine climate scientists raising a half billion dollars to counter this, and it's a very lopsided affair. Encouraging people to adopt a head and sand posture in the case of climate has some very real consequences, and it's not just in providing fodder for the cartoonists. There are very dangerous consequences to this, like making the Earth uninhabitable, unable to feed most of its seven billion humans. Population crashes are very cruel. They're full of famine, pestilence, war, and genocide. And that's the bottom line here. What we are facing in this climate crisis, if our efforts prove too little, too late. And particularly when you know that it's sort of the equivalent of encouraging the town drunkard to bury his head in the sand at the railroad tracks when you know there's a train coming. I mean, people who did that to the village drunkard, for example, would probably face spurter charges, but nothing like that is available as a remedy for the very concentrated effort that the fossil fuel industry is making to continue its profits a little longer. There's also quite a history to the big lie because one of its early practitioners proved so quotable. Uh, the bigger the lie, the more people will believe in it, it's Hitler's minister of propaganda. If you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. And Goebbels claimed in his diary that he could make people believe that triangles and circles were the same thing. Well, now ignore all the paid orchestration of denial and delay. What about honest differences? Let's explore it for a while. Uh, there's a number of things we sort of have to take on faith sometimes. Uh, but... For example, scientists have beliefs, just as a businessman might have a belief that opening a new restaurant on a particular street corner ought to be successful. 
But scientists' beliefs like this are always tentative. They're sort of what leads you to spend several years trying to get at the facts through clever experiments. But when you could finally establish the facts, say when the corner restaurant never turns a profit, facts trump beliefs. In science, we like to say with Thomas Huxley that the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And it happens all the time in science. It's the way we make progress. So there have been lots of facts that have developed since 1970. There's no doubt now that most of the overheating is due to the now 40% excess of CO2 in the air. Nor is there any doubt that this excess largely comes from deforestation and about four times larger fossil fuels. Nor is there any doubt that humans caused most of this, starting with pickaxe technologies. Most of the doubts now being raised about whether the global warming diagnosis is correct were the questions raised by scientists themselves back in the 1970s. But nearly all doubts have now been resolved by 40 years of hard work yielding new data. But you wouldn't know that from listening to the usual commentators. The public discussion has stayed stuck on the beginner's questions. Well, there's no end of people that you might blame for this. We could blame the loud mouse. We could blame the media for not showing up the loud mouse. We could blame the deny and delay squad. We could blame scientists for ineffective communication and education, for their failure to try a different approach after years. So let's discuss now the psychological defense mechanisms that lead into this. I originally thought when I started researching this subject that uh, it might be what in psychiatry is called denial at work, but now I'd say that's not the case. Uh, the medical meaning of denial is, goes like this. Uh, denial is, is perhaps the most primitive and best known of the psychological defense mechanisms. People may simply ignore unpleasant facts. They filter out stuff that conflicts with their self-image, their prejudices, their preconceived notions of others and of the world. When something interferes with our self-image or when we are afraid or guilty or confused, we tend to deny it. And climate involves all four of them. Even without the blowing smoke campaigns aimed at confusing people, what we now see are methods that were adopted from the earlier asbestos and tobacco campaigns being used to confuse people now. So which type of denial are we talking about? There are a number of connotations of which you'll find in the dictionary. Uh, we may uh, deny, you, we may say deny when we really mean to reject or refute or when we merely disbelieve something, uh, there is a medical level, sort of a delusion type denial. Uh, these patients are, really don't know they're doing it. It can take years of psychoanalysis to finally convince them of it. Or of course, denial could really just be avoidance uh, or it could be a cop-out, for example. Let's look at cop-out. Failure to engage with some aspects of climate science and geoengineering responses could be a cop-out. That's a delaying action because of fearing failure and wanting nothing to do with the failure. Now, we medical school professors try to teach the medical students the dangers of delaying action. One of the um, sayings is that the doc who waits until dead certain is likely to wind up with a dead patient. The military teaches this to its generals. But it, this is really part of the training of our political leaders and nor of our climate doctors. In fact, 
Uh, very few people are trained in, in thinking like this. So let me give you an example now of avoidance. You, you all remember the joke that everyone talks about the weather, but no one does something about it. Well, Steve Schneider decided to revise this to say, everyone does something about the weather, but no one talks about it. That's avoidance. Avoiders are not deniers. They're aware of the climate threat, and they accept the science, unlike deniers. They don't want to talk about it because it comes, because their own ethics would then require them to act, and action would be disruptive to their lives. For example, they might get slandered as alarmist or as a chicken little. Uh, you, they may not want to disturb the boss's good opinion of themselves. Uh, they might fear the spotlight and stage fright, having all that fo tension focused upon them. Then, of course, there's that Japanese saying about conformity in their society. The nail sticking up gets pounded back down. Furthermore, avoidance can be what's behind some kinds of optimism. And again, a medical school type example. Uh, physicians, if you study the records of what they wrote in the chart versus when the patient died, uh, it turns out that physicians overestimate survival times for two thirds of their stage four cancer patients. And if they know the patient well, that is say they're not just a consultant, but they're the primary care provider. If they know the patient well, their overestimate is much worse, like four in five cases they overestimate. So it's pretty clear from this, that there's some sort of unconscious optimism that can sway judgment via avoidance of the darker side, wishing people well, in effect. There's also taboo topics. Don't even mention it. Till recently, it was standard medical practice in Japan to avoid telling cancer patients about their diagnoses, to protect them from distress. And we all know of families, you know, where something like this still operates. Worse, talking about a run on the bank, for example, is sort of a taboo topic in public because of worries that it might trigger a run on the bank. But when this gets carried over into the planning, it's another matter. I mean, it's evident now that the housing bubble bursting in 2008 was probably a taboo topic amongst U.S. regulators um, back before then because they really had no plan for dealing with it. Now let me bring up a somewhat delicate topic, uh, which is considering whether there's avoidance even by climate scientists, or some climate scientists. And the only reason I, I really take this up uh, is because of the following things. First of all, the climate agenda has remained unchanged. As say, the, the diagnosis, the prognosis, the recommended treatments, really I haven't changed since the 70s. However, we're now in a situation where emissions reduction isn't going to do the job. It'll be too little, too late. Then there's the matter that we have, in the meantime, discovered that there are abrupt climate shifts. And so the question of how long do we have is now not just a matter of what the computer models predict about gradual warming. Simply, there are abrupt events that we don't know how to predict. So let's look at some of the talk about emissions reductions. Uh, emissions are defined as the extra CO2 emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, at where the, the carbon in the CO2 is taken out of long-term storage. 
For example, it's uh, losing forests because they're not replanted, or burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, and as it turns out, making concrete. <laughs> Reducing annual emissions is a perfectly sensible course of action had it been done 50 years ago. Back when the red flags were already flying, it might have sufficed, but it wasn't done. It really isn't 50 or 60 years ago anymore. For example, the computer models of how fast it's going to warm up show that with, with business as usual emissions, with them continuing to grow at the current 3% per year, the year of the two degree fever is 2049. Serious emissions reductions taking the, the most slowly rising scenario of all the economic scenarios that the models ran. So sort of the top curve and the bottom curve of the uh, spread of outcomes. Only delays this disastrous two degree overheating by about 19 years. So in effect, all of the efforts that we're making and not succeeding at uh, are really in aid of buying no more than about 19 extra years. Would suggest that something else in addition had better be done. Well, this isn't really comic relief, but it reads, and when we look at the future given to us by our elders, three words come to mind. We are toast. But that's if we don't do anything about it. But the talk, the, the goals set are so wimpy that I think that even the graduating seniors might have noticed. Many now think that achieving zero emissions later this century will do the job. Or lacking that, stopping the 3% annual growth in CO2 emissions is an adequate goal for responding to climate change. But notice here, we're now talking at two removes from the real problem, which is excess CO2 already in the air. Reduced emissions will not get rid of the current excess quickly enough or in a way which avoids dangerous acidification of the surface ocean. So there's an interesting bit of word substitution, or at least meaning substitution, going on here that should consist. People are talking as if current emissions, as they this year's emissions, were the real problem. They are not. The accumulation of excess CO2 is the real problem. It's what sets off desert expansion, deluge and drought, heat waves, and all the rest. But talking about emissions as the real problem leads to thinking that reducing them can solve the problem. That may have been true once, but not any longer. So here, here's an example of changing the subject, which might be relevant here, uh, to the extent that the de deny and delay squad has gotten in the act. Suppose you ask your prospective spouse, how much money do you have in the bank? And he answers, I earn 5000 a month. And so you try again, and he answers, and I've been getting a 3% raise each year. You might be forgiven for wondering if he knows the difference between net worth, income, and raises. Or maybe he's trying to change the subject, say, because of a negative net worth. Now, while few climate scientists would do this, that's not necessarily true of a number of the other actors in this drama. The other thing that is surely discouraging to anybody that looks at this carefully is that our current climate response, our prescription for how to solve the problem, is mostly just a re-emphasis of the old virtues of clean air, clean energy, sustainable agriculture, reforestation, greater efficiency, less waste, and of course, longer term thinking. 
which unfortunately papers over the short-term part of the problem. Now, looking at this list of good things to do, they'd be good things to do even without a climate problem, but the deny and delay squad types suggest that all this is just green activism in new clothing with climate as a new rationale so that we, since we reject you know, green thinking, we can ignore the problem. So emissions reductions, we should realize, only scale down to future CO2 additions. They don't subtract from the CO2 that's already accumulated. While emissions reduction is all that most people talk about doing in response, it neither stops making things worse, nor does it rid us of the accumulated past emission. While deforestation and fossil fuel emissions are what got us into trouble, it does not follow that fixing them will get us out of trouble. That's like thinking that stopping smoking is a sufficient treatment for lung cancer, or that brushing your teeth more regularly will fix the cavity you've already got. It's time to acknowledge that the current climate prescription is another such fallacy and seek a real fix. Thanks to 50 years of climate avoidance, we now need a short-term fix cleaning up the air CO2 to make the long-term redesigns viable. So in the next section, I'm going to ask, why has the climate diagnosis, prognosis, and suggested course treatment stayed stuck on what was obvious in the late 1970s, despite the growing evidence that all three must be changed. So in the 1970s, and still, the diagnosis is presented as CO2 poisoning. The prognosis of is that will slowly overheat, will start running a fever. And the intervention needed is to reduce emissions. So after 40 years, they changed, but the story hasn't. The diagnosis, the way I would formulate it, would be now CO2 poisoning with climate instability and ocean acidifications as complications that may kill us off sooner than the CO2 heat waves. The prognosis Sudden climate shifts atop the global fear with the threat of population crash. The intervention needed is to reduce emissions, but also to remove the excess CO2 already in the air. So why have our climate doctors settled for such an outdated, inadequate framing of our climate problem? Well, first of all, Treating the patient is not something they train for. I mean, they didn't set out to become earth doctors. Uh, in fact, no one did. Secondly, the climate science community is getting lots of, in retrospect, I think, one-sided advice on the matter, simply because it doesn't balance them against risk management. To some extent, the climate scientists have to focus on those parts of the problem that the public and policymakers can comprehend. Knowledgeable politicians usually advise the climate scientists to tailor the climate message to emphasize clean energy. Furthermore, the psychologists have told the climate scientists that fear-based appeals, especially those not coupled with a clear solution, can backfire. For example, telling the climate story and ending with a list of emissions reductions possibilities is more likely to make the, the person believe the underlying science than is an explanation pointing to a catastrophe with no proposal for avoiding it. Unfortunately, history shows us that this can lead to further tailoring 
of the message to emphasize what reluctant ears will listen to. It could drive you into reporting smoke rather than the fire you actually observed. And history is replete with examples of this. Climate scientists have mostly sobered up to their painful role as modern day Cassandras, uh, pointing at a Trojan horse and no one listening to them. But, like those Japanese cancer physicians, might some be trying to spare us the worst news? I doubt this, but the matter is so important that we must keep asking questions. We scientists, I think, have a responsibility to speak frankly, even about things that we cannot back up yet with data. Scientists often don't do this, uh, and there are very substantial traditions about remaining politically neutral, for example, on something, and giving accurate advice to both sides. But these rationales that scientists give for avoiding speculation are seldom applicable to situations where time is short and informed opinions are wrong. The real problem is not opinions, but informed opinions uh, often are being withheld. If we're forced to act on incomplete knowledge, and I think we are, then the people doing the guessing should be the most knowledgeable of them. And they should remember what Hippocrates said 2,500 years ago to physicians. Life is short, the art long, opportunity fleeting, experience treacherous, judgment difficult. But in spite of all that, the physician must be ready not only to do his duty himself, but also to secure the cooperation of the patient, of the attendants, and of externals. In terms of what to do, I will cover a second opinion on what to do about climate in a subsequent talk, also on YouTube. Now to wrap up climate denial. And again, these are my opinions summarizing the subject. Are the deniers stupid? No, I think follow the money is a much better possibility. Are the deniers uninformed by choice? I think they often are. Uh, is there avoidance going on? My guess is there's lots and lots of it. Is the denial at the level of real delusions, psychiatric level? My guess is not very many. Why the scientists' inadequate framing of the di climate diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment? Well, I think mostly they're just outdated and haven't uh, undertaken a real reframing. All these problems of climate denial were also true of Americans' denial of evolution. But there, there was little economic interest, little paid obfuscation, making things worse. Uh, for example, the, that the climate problem is just liberal ideology is perhaps a cover story to obscure the fact that vast amounts of money are being spent to manipulate us, and not by the scientists. All this brings up humanity's fatal flaw of whether we're dealing with something here that could really uh, kill off the larger part of, the, of humans. Aristotle said that a fatal flaw is an injury committed in ignorance with disastrous consequences. So this was Greek theater's overriding theme long before Aristotle coined the phrase about 2,400 years ago. Is that going here? Well, it might truly be a delusion of believing in possible things, some of which are dangerous. But I guess it's closer to an insufficient wariness about the money and motives behind leading to dire. I 
think that fear of being on the outs uh, is uh, much more the problem here, much more likely to be the fatal flaw. Uh, climate denial is being so is a part of the creed that you ought to subscribe to if you want to remain a member of the party or climb the corporate ladder. Fear of exclusion is much easier to orchestrate with money than encouraging delusion, delusions which might require a much, much larger budget. The denial take-homes, avoidance is more likely than true denial. Obfuscation, there's lots of money behind blowing smoke to confuse the issues. The denial industry, delay, is their most important product. Third, reframing the problem can hide the real problem. That is to say, reframing it as emissions rather than as CO2 accumulation. Fourth, the creation of taboo topics now seems to include geoengineering, and that's probably not uh, fault of the same people. Next time I'll discuss what to do about climate and how quickly it has to be done. A good place to stop.